Journey to the Cross, we are in our, our mini-series, our five-week, or is it, uh, series, uh, looking at Jesus' journey to the cross through his ministry years. And what we've been doing is we will take a circumstance or something that happened from the life of Jesus and not necessarily preach and speak on that particular thing, but use it as a reflection or as an example of something else to bring in another teaching. So it's just a way to teach through different topics, but doing it looking at Jesus's life all the way to uh, the cross. So uh, this week is the preparation of Jesus. Uh, last week was the Passover of Jesus. This week is the preparation of Jesus. And next week will be the persecution of Jesus on Easter Sunday. So uh, in the preparation of Jesus, and I'll kind of give you a little teaser here, then we'll get into Mark chapter 14. If you want to start uh, your way there, turning to Mark chapter 14, I'll explain our journey today. Uh, Jesus did a lot of preparing for his ministry. And as we're going to look at here in Mark chapter 14, Jesus was preparing for the cross. Now, what was something that Jesus often did to prepare for ministry? It's a really easy question. What is it? Pray. He prayed. Good job. Okay, so today we're actually going to look into prayer. We're going to look at his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane to use that to reflect on another time that he actually taught about praying. He didn't really pray in this time, but he gave us a teaching, and then we're going to get into it. All right, everybody in Mark chapter 14, uh, if you're not there, words are going to be up on the screen for you. Here we go. Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 32. It says, they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will but what you will. Then he returned to the disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. So we all know what is right about to happen. And again, not going to cover that this week. We're going to save that for next week. But last week, if you remember, we talked about the Passover. And Jesus had the Passover supper, or we often call it the Last Supper. And Jesus, I want to kind of paint this picture for you. Because if you haven't been to Israel, and specifically Jerusalem... It's, it's helpful when you read through passages like this to be able to actually picture where they were and where they were going on their journey as they were traveling in and out of Jerusalem. So um, we're going to show you some pictures here, but Jesus is in what's called the upper room. Now, this is in Jerusalem. Go ahead and show that first picture. Okay, so this is Lacey and I. Lacey and I are standing on top of the Mount of Olives, and I think I've showed this picture before. And if you look right to the left of my beautiful shiny head right there, you see another shiny object right there. Okay, that is the Dome of the Rock. Okay, that is an Islamic mosque. That is exactly where the temple used to be. Uh, and you see the big wall going around the old city of Jerusalem. That is Jerusalem right there, and that's the Temple Mount up on top. Uh, the building on the left-hand side there that's right up on top, that's the Al-Aqsa Mosque. That's like the third, I believe, most holy place in the Islamic uh, religion. So 
If you look to the left of, I can see it on this one a little bit better, the left of the wall, the left of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, not all the way in the back corner to where that building is with the thing sticking up, but part of the way back that way, that's where the upper room was. Okay, so we're on top of the Mount of Olives. You go down into the Kidron Valley and then up onto uh, where Jerusalem is. So that's where Jesus was, up there, somewhere over there to the left in the upper room. We got to go to a place where they believe is the upper room. Uh, pretty cool, obviously, renovated, rebuilt and everything. Uh, but so that's where they were. And they're going down into the Garden of Gethsemane uh, to... Uh, pray. So now go ahead to the next picture. So Jesus would have been up there. So now we're up closer to the upper room looking across over at the Mount of Olives. So everybody following me here. Now this is one of my favorite pictures that I took. This picture does not look like much. And I may have even showed this picture before too. This is an ancient Roman road. Now again, we don't know. The Bible doesn't specify specifically. But Knowing what we know about the roads that were traveled, knowing what we know about where we believe the upper room was, the path down to the Mount of Olives, most scholars believe this was the road that Jesus walked down from the upper room, down this kind of stepped road, and then up onto the Mount of Olives into the uh, Garden of Gethsemane to pray. Now, See that fence right there to the right-hand side? Here's what's really cool. Again, doesn't really have a whole lot to do with today. Again, more next week. But there's a courtyard right to there where you can't see. And that is believed to be where the courtyard was, where there was a fire going, and Peter denied Jesus three times. There's actually a big uh, statue of Peter there and a rooster, and it's called St. Peter of Galicantu. And that's where they believe that happened. And the reason why they believe that is because right next to that, now kind of a church uh, is there. It's a huge monument. And that's where they believe the high priest's house was. And what's important to that was when Jesus left the upper room from the Passover dinner, walked down this Roman road, up onto the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane, and we'll get to a picture of that in just a minute, he was arrested right there. Judas betrayed him right there. He would have been walked back up this same road and taken, the gate wasn't there then, but he would have taken right into the courtyard, into the high priest's house. That's where he would have been held at first. And really, I don't know if cool is the right word, but if you go down below the high priest's house, there's actually a, a jail down there. And it's not a jail like we would think of, it's a holding cell. And, you, and it's really a cave underneath there. And you go inside and there's holes cut out of rocks up above. And they would take ropes and throw a rope through this hole and tie it onto their wrists. And that's where they would just kind of halfway hang, halfway stand up. And that's where they would be held. And that's, again, where we believe Jesus was held while he was arrested and tried right before he was crucified. Then he was taken across town over to Pilate's house to be tried. He was kind of shuffled back and forth. So anyway, so that's just to kind of paint a picture. And then this next picture here, the last picture, this is what is left of kind of a preserved area of the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, don't think garden like we think of, like pretty flowers and stuff. Think more like a grove. It was an olive grove. These are olive trees. Um, these are very, very small ones. On the other side over there, you can't see in this picture, but there were massive, ma I mean, massive, big around olive trees that they believe are probably at least a thousand years old, if not more. Were they the trees that were there when Jesus was there? We don't know. It doesn't really matter. But this is the uh, Garden of Gethsemane or just basically an olive grove where Jesus would often go to pray. All right, everybody got that? There's your little uh, geography lesson there. So, okay. So I just thought that was cool. It's, it's really good to kind of paint a picture as we're telling these stories. Uh, but again, like I said, Jesus would often go there to pray, to prepare for what was coming, prepare for his ministry, and now to prepare for his death, burial, and resurrection. So let's ask some questions to get our minds thinking a little bit so we can really get into the message. 
Here's a really good question. It's a valid question. Have you ever wondered why Jesus prayed? You ever wondered that? It's a good question. It's not a, don't, don't, oh, you no, know, it's heretical to think that. It's a really good question. Why did Jesus pray? Like, wasn't Jesus God? Was Jesus just praying to himself? Was he just kind of talking to himself? Was Jesus, like, just maybe doing it as an example for the disciples? So those are some questions. I'm going to give you the short answer because I don't want you to just be hanging out there. We're not really going to look at that aspect of prayer today. But to answer your questions, why did Jesus pray? Was, wasn't he God in the flesh? Absolutely he was. Jesus was absolutely God in the flesh. But remember, Jesus is one-third of the Godhead. You've got God the Father, God the... And God the... Okay, there's three parts that make one God, not three gods, one God, but three very distinct persons. Now, admittedly, do our tiny human pea brains really fathom that concept of the Trinity and three people becoming one God? Probably not. Mine doesn't. I'll just throw that out there. Mine doesn't. But do I trust? Because that's what God's word says over and over and over. Absolutely. 1,000%. So was Jesus God in the flesh? Yes, he was. But he was praying to his father. Did Jesus pray as an example for his disciples and, and those around? Yes, he did. But here in this case, he was very much pleading to the father. So here's... here's something that I want us to learn. And in, in communicating and in, in public speaking and all that, they, they often teach you to do three things, okay? Number one, tell your audience or tell your congregation what you're going to tell them, and then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. Brain surgery, right? Big stuff. That's what we did last week with our key statement, and that's what we're gonna do again this week, it, it's, it's very simple. I, I want us to all walk out of here at, 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 at nothing else understanding what prayer is. So last week, we had a key statement. It kind of maybe started off a little bit weird. You may have pushed back against it a little bit. But last week, our key statement was, the basis of a relationship with God is the blood of an innocent victim. That was our key statement. That's what I wanted you to remember from last week. And again, at first it may have been like, it's kind of weird, I don't really get it, I'm pushing back, I may not agree with it, but at the very end when we tied it to that very simple, innocent question that Isaac asked, where is the lamb? Where is the lamb? Father, we're going up on this mountain, his father Abraham, we're going on this mountain to do this sacrifice. Um, we've got fire, we've got wood, you've got a knife, um, but we don't have a lamb. And Abraham said, God himself will provide a lamb for us. And so we kind of covered that story. So understanding that, understanding that there has to be bloodshed and a sacrifice because of our sin. The basis of a relationship with God is the blood of an innocent victim. So again, let's ask this question. What exactly is prayer? What what is prayer. Now, prayer is a lot of things. Is it communicating with God? Yes, that's part of it. Um, is it a way to get what you want? Um, yes, but I wouldn't necessarily look at it like that. It's a way to take our request to God. Yeah, but Oftentimes, don't we drift in that direction of we pray because we're using it to get what we want? So we do that. Um, is prayer something we do before meals? Yes, but if that's the only time you pray and that's the only reason because, well, we're getting ready to have a meal, so I guess it's time to pray, that's not really the right type of prayer or the right usage of prayer. And all prayer is wonderful, I, I, but we're going to kind of hone in a little bit today on what prayer is. And 
I see this a lot. Many people have a wrong understanding of prayer or often use prayer for the wrong motive. So I want to I want to answer this question, what is prayer? Now, I'm going to kind of give a definition, but just understand, this is not an all-encompassing definition. Prayer is much more theologically than what we're going to show today. But in understanding today, in the context of what we're going to talk about today and in three weeks, because I wrote way too many notes and there is so much to cover about prayer, we're going to, we're going to come back to it here in a few weeks the definition that we're going to look at today just kind of applies to what we're talking about. So here, they're like, get on with it already. Come on. Okay, so here's our key statement today. You're going to see this a couple times today and in a few weeks. Prayer is an invitation. That's the big word right there. An invitation for God to join you in your pursuit of what's important. Now, pause right there. Don't, don't worry about the next part of it yet. This statement has been bouncing around in my head for months, months and months and months, because I have people ask me about prayer a lot. I, I see people as they're praying through things or as I'm praying with them through things, and sometimes their prayers are being answered how they would like. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's like, God, where are you? You know, like, so all of these things. So I have these conversations a lot. I see this a lot, and so this statement has been just really God laid it on my heart to share this and it's it's come out of my mouth a few times since then but that we don't see prayer as this opportunity to invite God into what's important in our lives we use it as that tool to get what we want or because we're going to eat or for whatever and, and again, to, to a certain extent, those things are okay, and we use it as a communication tool to God. That is absolutely what we're supposed to do. But in this context, in, in us talking about this for a couple weeks, I want us to think about that. Really think about prayer is a way to invite God into things that are important in your life. What, because you pray about the important things in your life, don't you? Like you get a diagnosis, you have a relationship issue, you have a huge opportunity that you need some discernment and advice about. Like all of these things, like you need a good parking spot at the mall when it's raining, like all of those things, who do you go to? You go to God with those things. Those are the things that are important in your life. So I want us to see prayer in this context. Again, it's much more than this. Don't, don't roast me at the stake for just compartmentalizing prayer like this, but I want us to see prayer as an invitation to say, hey God, here's what's going on in my life, and I want to invite you, I want to invite your wisdom and your counsel uh, just, just to be a part of this, and, and God, I, I, I want to ask you about this, but, but God, I, I, I want you to be involved in this area of my life because this is what's important, this is what I've got going on right now. Does that make sense? And I think oftentimes we forget about that component. We forget that God just wants relationship with us. God wants to walk alongside of us. And what do we do? We often strong arm God until we need him. God, I don't, I don't, things are going okay right now. I don't really need you in my life right now. And then that thing happens and then it's, oh God, I need you right now. But God just wants to walk alongside of us in this journey through life. So, uh, prayer is an invitation for God to join you in your pursuit of what's important. Now, the second half of that key statement is kind of in this definition, it's saying what prayer is not, because we often drift this way. And prayer is not a tool to leverage God to get what you want. Now, I know none of us would ever do that, right? Because we're church people. But, but we hear of other people doing that, right? Prayer is not a tool to leverage God to get what you want. So today, and again, in three weeks from today, when we finish this out, is more of a what is prayer message rather than a how-to-pray message. We've, we've done how-to-pray messages before. I don't know that I've ever really, in, in this depth,
preached a what is prayer to get us to have a better understanding so that we can pray better. And like I've said, many people have a very wrong idea of what prayer is. Um, if you listen to a lot of music, and, and oftentimes in country music, but it's in a lot of music, they talk a lot about prayer. Now, there's, there's one song in particular that this, this guy got it right. And I actually, years ago, I preached a message and I read the lyrics of this song. It's a song called Unanswered Prayers by who? Garth Brooks. All right. So, and, and, it, and, it, and, and, and it says this. It says, some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. I am a living testament to that. I, not going to tell you because it's too personal, but just saying, amen, Garth Brooks, you crushed it, bro. Okay, so he got that one right. So oftentimes songs talk about prayer. Sometimes they get it a little bit wrong, and I came across one recently. This is a song called Pray For You, and, and, and it means it's, it's almost like, I will pray for you. Uh, and I got to give him credit. It's by Jaron Lowenstein. I'll read the lyrics. It says, I haven't been to church since I don't remember when. Things were going great till they fell apart again. So I listened to the preacher as he told me what to do. Now pause. You guys should write that down. Just say it. He said you can't go hating others who have done wrong to you. Doing good so far. Sometimes we get angry, but we must not condemn. Let the good Lord do his job. You just pray for them. Now I'm going, all right. Good job, man. He's, he's, he's pretty much got this. And then we get to the chorus. It goes like this. I pray your brakes go out running down a hill. I pray a flower pot falls from a windowsill and knocks you in the head. Like, um, I think you're missing the point of the preacher's message, bro. Maybe it'll get better in the second half of the chorus. I pray your birthday comes and nobody calls. I pray you're flying high when your engine stalls. Whew line in the sand right there. I pray all your dreams never come true. Just know wherever you are, honey, I pray for you. I think he needs to go back to church, right? I don't think he listened all that well to the preacher. So let's break down some of the key components of prayer. Um, and to do that, I want to look at the passage of the triumphal entry. So if you're still there in Mark 14, you can flip right back over to Mark chapter 11. So now while you're doing that, I want to read our key statement again today. Prayer is an invitation for God to join you in your pursuit of what's important. Prayer is not a tool to leverage God to get what you want. Here we go. Mark chapter 11, this is the triumphal entry, or as we're celebrating today, we know this as the passage of Palm Sunday, right? This is Jesus riding into town, and we're going to see that today. Mark 11, verse 1, it says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. There's where we get Palm Sunday right there. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. 
Hosanna in the highest heaven. Now, when they were shouting Hosanna, that word Hosanna means save us or save now. And the problem is when he rode into town, the triumphal entry, they were all shouting Hosanna, praise God, save us, like you are the one that was sent for us. And then just a few short days later, what were they yelling? Crucify him. Why did that change? Because when they were yelling, save us, save now, they were looking for a saving from their political opponents. They were not looking to be saved from their sin. That'll preach. We'll just leave that one right there. Verse 11. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now, verses 12 and 13 are going to be the first of our two sections of the part that we're really going to concentrate on. We get a little snippet of it, we get a few verses in between, and then we're going to go back to it. So verse 12 says, The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again, as the disciples heard him say it. Now, pause that part of the story. We've got a few verses to go, and then we'll get back into that part again. Verse 15. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. And would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written? My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. So, pause again for a second. We're getting ready to get into section number two. Understand, there was two towns that were named Bethpage and Bethany. So, you have the Temple Mount, where the upper room was, all that area, Jerusalem. You go down the Kidron Valley. You go up to the Mount of Olives. That's where the Garden of Gethsemane was. You go over the Mount of Olives, and you would have a little town called Bethpage, and then you would have Bethany. Bethany is where Jesus would stay most of the time. It was the home of Mary, Martha, and anybody know, bonus points, Lazarus. Anything really cool happened with Lazarus recently? Yeah, Lazarus was raised from the dead there, right? So that's where Jesus would stay in Bethany when he would come and visit in Jerusalem, when he would celebrate Passover. Every time, that's, that's where he would normally stay. Okay, verse 20, here we go. In the morning... As they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Now again, pause. What a strange response, right? Peter's freaking out that this tree that Jesus had cursed the day before was withered. And Jesus just, in, in true Jesus fashion, I love it. Oftentimes, you, at first glance, it's like, Jesus, you're not making any sense here. This doesn't have anything to do with it. As we dig in later on, it's like, oh, I see what you were doing there. Jesus just says, have faith in God. Jesus didn't address the small thing. He didn't address the tree. Jesus addressed the bigger thing, the issue of faith. Verse 22, have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your father in heaven 
may forgive your sins. Now, I left 26 right there. That's where the chapter in the NIV ends and some other translations. Just in case you're wondering if you're reading a drift, different translation, if there is a verse 26 there, here's what most scholars think happened. As some of the scribes were copying down the book of Mark, uh, many scribes think that, the, or, or many scholars think that the scribes added a verse to the end of this chapter. Now, before you go freaking out, thinking this is heretical anything, it makes sense. It goes along with the passage, and there's a parallel passage in the book of Matthew that that verse is attached to. So what it looks like is they've taken a verse from Matthew and put it over at the end of this chapter. So some translations, you do not see that verse there, but in your translation, if the verse is not there, it may just have a 26 or it may have an explanation. So just in case anybody was wondering, that's what that is. So that's where that story ends. So five components of powerful prayer. Here's what we're going to look at over this week and then in three weeks. Next week is Easter. We've got something else planned for that following week, and then we'll get back into this. But five components of powerful prayer. Now, these five components are not in order of importance necessarily. They are just in order of how we see them here in this passage. And number one is kind of a big one. It's, it's one, and I struggled with breaking up this message as I always do, like, okay, this isn't a full, I had a full message and I had to break it in half, but I think this first one is big enough that we can just park here, understand what we've learned so far about what prayer is, concentrate on number one, and if we get that one right, I think we'll be doing pretty well. So number one, five components of powerful prayer. There is a historical component, a historical component. I, I've been researching this and, and just studying on this. I saw these, these parts, somebody pointed them out, and I was like, okay, I, this is where we need to go, historical component. And I wrote this down. Remember what God has done in the past to believe what he can do in the future. That right there is worth the price of admission, of remembering what God has done in our past to believe what he can do in the future. In verses 20 and 21, it says, In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Now, when he says these two little statements, Look at what is at the end of those statements or sentences. What, what is that? What punctuation mark is that? It's an exclamation point. Peter's freaking out about this. So here we go. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Doesn't really sound like that much to get excited about, does it? So I want to play off of this word remember. There's, there's, we're going to maybe extrapolate a little bit more out of this here, but Peter has seen hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of miracles done by Jesus. It, it even says in one of the Gospels, this is the account of the things that Jesus did and there was so much more, there's like not even enough room to write it all down of everything that Jesus did. So like, like we just get a little bit of a glimpse into Jesus' three or so years of his ministry. So back to our point, Peter has seen probably thousands upon thousands of miracles. Why was it such a big deal to him? that Jesus cursed a fig tree and it withered away the next day. Have you ever thought about that? This is one of the things I love 
when, when, when I'm teaching God's word, I love to point these things out because, again, it's just a reminder for us and, and man, myself included, when we're reading scripture, don't just read scripture to just to say, I did it that day, or you got your check mark, or this, I just, I, I got to do it, and you're just reading it because you've got some other important things to do. Um, look at it. Dissect it. Why in the world would Peter be so jacked up about a simple little fig tree? Anybody know? Here's an interesting observation. This was the first destructive miracle that Jesus had done in the Gospels. Think about that. Every other miracle that Jesus had done was constructive. It was a positive thing. And Peter's going, uh, we've never seen this before. This is different. This is a different kind of power. Like, Jesus, can you do that too? Can you curse something? And obviously, we look at it in hindsight go, yeah, of course Jesus can do that, silly. But, but Peter is living this in real time. Um, and again, if, if you don't turn there now, but if you look at the parallel account in Matthew chapter 21... It gives us, about this at least, a little more explanation as to why Peter was so freaked out. Now, in the book of Mark, it says Jesus was speaking to Peter. In Matthew, it just says the disciples. It was like it was thrown out to an open conversation, but it was probably directly Peter. He asked the question, and this isn't how he asked it, but if you look at it in Matthew, this is basically what Peter was asking. He was asking how does this kind of power work, Jesus? Like, we've seen you do a lot of positive things. We've never seen you do something destructive like this. How does this kind of power work? C Jesus, can you even do that? But see, we've got to remember how awesome, how powerful, how amazing, how good that Jesus is. Because when we face something in life that seems like it just might be a little bit too hard for Jesus or he maybe isn't interested in that area of life or maybe he's just not going to pay attention to me for that, we've got to remember back to all of the amazing things that Jesus has done. Remember what God has done in the past to believe what he can do in the future. This is all through scripture. Don't turn there, but in Deuteronomy... All through Deuteronomy, especially like starting in about chapter 8 and on. Remember what the Lord has done. Remember what the Lord has done. It's about 15 times in the book of Deuteronomy. Remember that God brought you through the Red Sea. Remember that you got water from a rock. Remember that you got manna from heaven. Remember how he saved you. Remember how, you know those shoes on your feet? They didn't go bad in the 40 years out here you were wandering. Remember, remember, remember what God has done to understand what God can do in the future. There has to be this historical component of prayer for us to realize how good God is, how much he wants for us, and what he can and will do if we are asking in the right way. Isaiah chapter 46, again, it talks about remember what God has done. Oftentimes when we sing worship songs, we are singing, we are worshiping God, but what are we singing? What are the words we're singing? We're kind of retelling stories about things that, have, that God has done. We sing a song called Same God, and it's walking through all of these things that God has done throughout history, remembering. Is that because God has forgotten what he's done in the past? And we need to remind him, hey, God, you were good before, so I don't know if you remember, but you did this thing so you can do this thing for me. Is that the right way to approach it? Probably not. Who's it for when we sing words like that? It's to remind us. We're worshiping God, but we're reminding ourselves of the amazing things that God has done so that we can look forward and know what he can do in the future. I, I heard this, this line. I don't even remember where I heard it. I think it was in one of my morning devotions this week, and it was so good. 
He said, never trade what you do know about God for what you don't. I thought that was so good. Never trade what you do know about God. What do we know? We know God's good. We know God is kind. We know God is just. He gave you life. He gave you salvation. He gave you that breath that you just took. He has placed you in the most amazing country ever, the most benevolent, wonderful country. Sure, we've got our problems, but like you are blessed beyond measure. I think the statistic is somewhere around if you have a household income of $50,000 or so, you are in the top 2% of the entire world. God is good. We sat at the dinner table the other day and explained to Isla, my nine-year-old, that how many people, billions, live on less than $2 a day. Because we were talking about gratitude and being thankful. That's who God is. He is so good. And man, you may be facing some rough circumstances. You may be facing something that it doesn't look like you're going to get through. You, you, you may be down and out and, and you just don't think you can do it anymore. We need to remember what God has done in the past to know what God can do in the future. There's a historical component to prayer. And oftentimes we just, we hit that wall, we stumble, and we forget about all of the goodness of God before. And we start to let our minds go down that road of, well, God, you must not be hearing me. And then we go, well, God, you must not care. And then we say, God, you must not really be good, and you must not love me. And then you know where we end up? God, you must not be real. And that's where we let our minds go. But if we remember what God has done in the past, he's so good. And it may be rough right now. I'm not discounting anything that you may be going through. But he's gotten you through this far. Remember what God has done. Never trade what you do know about God for what you don't. Let's pray. God, you are so good. God, we thank you that we, we could spend the rest of the day, the days on end, God, going around this room and telling stories about your goodness. God, of all the amazing things that you have done in all of our lives, and we would blow each other away with our stories because you are so good. But God, in our our sinful hearts and our sinful and doubting ways, we run into a little bit of opposition. We run into a little bit of hardship. And God, we often forget about your goodness. God, forgive us for that. Forgive me for that, God. Help us to remember your goodness. And God, I, I know I'm no fool, God. I know that there may be some people right now that just are so buried in the thick of it that they can't remember. They just cannot think of anything good that you have done. God, comfort that person. Love on that person. May your spirit fall just so strongly on that person. But God, in that moment, if they cannot think of anything good, help them to remember the cross. Because, God, if you did nothing for us but send the best possible thing that you had, your son Jesus, to live amongst us, to die for us, and to be resurrected again. God, if that was the only thing that you ever gave us, it would be enough. It would be so much more than enough. So God, help us if we cannot even think of anything else good to remember the cross. Remember the cross. God, I lift up people this morning right now who just don't have that understanding of you. They don't have that relationship with you. 
God, right now in this moment, would they turn their hearts towards you? Speak to their hearts, Lord. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, if you don't have that relationship with God, maybe you were taught something different growing up. You were taught that your works can get you into heaven. Your good deeds are going to count for something that is nowhere in Scripture. When compared to the salvation of God, our good deeds are nothing. So if that's you this morning and you want to start a relationship with Jesus right now, sitting where you are, would you just say, God, I need you. God, I want you. Be my Savior. Save me. Change me. I give you my life. Again, heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that prayer for the first time this morning, I would love to know. I would love to celebrate it. I'm not going to call you out or cause any commotion, but would you just slip your hand up and say, I got it right today. I made a decision to follow Jesus today, to make him the Lord and the master of my life. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you that you were willing. Thank you, Jesus, that you saw it so important to prepare for the hardest thing that you ever went through, to be beaten beyond recognition and to hang on a cross to spill out all of your blood for me. Thank you for that perfect gift, that sacrifice, Jesus. Thank you that you are the Lamb. Help us to remember that. And God, help us to pray with the right heart, the right intentions, the right motives to invite you, God, into what is important in our lives. God, we lift up this time of offering. God, help us to be a generous church, to look out into this community, into this world, to make a difference. Not a difference that's going to matter in a few years, but a difference that's going to matter in 10,000 years. Help us to be generous, God. We love you. We praise you, Lord. And it is in the powerful name of Jesus that I pray. Amen.